Thanks, Karen, and, and I'd like to welcome all of you. My name is Bruce Stokes of the Pew Research Center, and we're very pleased and honored to have with us Cecilia Malmstrom, who's the EU uh, Commissioner for Trade, and Michael Froman, who is the USTR. Um, we, uh, they spent about six or so hours today uh, talking with each other, so we're very pleased that they've chosen the Brussels Forum to announce that they've completed TTIP, and <laughs> everything is... <laughs> we only wish and that sure. that could be the case, unfortunately. Uh, this is obviously the single most important transatlantic economic initiative since the Marshall Plan. It is terribly, terribly important for economic and strategic reasons, and we'll get into some of that. Uh, the challenge, though, is that um, in America, while our surveys at the Pew Research Center show that by two to one, Americans think that this is a good idea, frankly, a third of the public has no opinion. They haven't heard about it. So it really is not an issue of much discussion in the United States. Europe is a slightly different situation. It is, in fact, a topic of great discussion in Europe. Uh, the Eurobarometer survey uh, late last year showed that a majority of Europeans support it. Uh, and in fact, uh, countries representing a majority of the European population support it, the majority of the GDP support it. The problem is that less than half the population in Austria, Luxembourg, and most importantly, Germany don't support it. So it is a controversial issue. Uh, friends of mine in the European Parliament tell me supporters of TTIP that they don't think they have the votes in the European Parliament today to pass TTIP. Now, thank goodness, they're, for TTIP, there's not going to be a vote today on this, but it is, it is a sign of the political struggle. Um, and in the United States, the political issue is that we first have to have a vote on fast track or trade promotion authority before we could consider any trade agreement. Then we will hopefully have a vote on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, assuming we can get it done. And uh, that then raises questions about ordering and, and when we get to, to TTIP. But first of all, we have to have a TTIP agreement, and that's what uh, uh, Mike Froman and Cecilia Malmstrom are talking about uh, today. If I could um, possibly ask a question for both of you, uh, and we'll get to the audience about halfway through this because we want to hear from you on these issues. Um, you both announced what you called a fresh start. Uh, to these talks uh, a couple months ago. I'm curious, what in the world does a fresh start mean? And I put that in the context of, uh, it appears that the target date for completion keeps slipping, at least to out, the perception of outsiders, that right now we're more or less talking about having an agreement, maybe in principle by the end of the year, but then we know agreements in principle mean that you still have details to resolve, and that means we're slipping into next year. Then we run into the American presidential campaigns and the fact that Congress isn't in session much of next year. Gets it, and it looks increasingly like, to an outside observer, that at best we could have a vote in the United States in 2017. And I would assume that the European Parliament's not going to move any faster than the U.S. Congress simply because why would they? So I think the question, I guess, is what does a fresh start mean to both of you? Well, it means uh, many things. For us, it meant, uh, in the European Union, it meant um, engaging with the citizens in a totally new way because now we were entering into the real negotiations. It meant a lot more transparency, uh, putting the, the mandate, but also many of our negotiating documents online, engaging with the stakeholders, citizen groups, both in the different countries, but also in, in Brussels, uh, trying to, to live up to that that you referred to in the beginning, that there is a lot of, of controversy, but showing that there is, there is no secret agenda here. We want to engage, we want to listen, we want to be transparent, we want to answer the questions, we want to dispel the myths. And then also on the fresh start in, in content when it comes to negotiation is that there is always a start of, of, of you know, laying out technicalities on the table, getting to know each other, uh, putting the different positions there. Now we are moving slowly because it is difficult, we're not there for tomorrow, but there's a firm <coughs> determination and we both show that today. Uh, we are moving into more political uh, phase where we hopefully soon can really get into the, the, the real tough negotiations as well. 
Mike, what does it mean to you? Well, look, I, I agree uh, with, uh, with Cecilia. This is an opportunity now to look at the whole array of issues mm -hmm. on the table, uh, whether it's the traditional trade issues mm -hmm. like market access, but also the issues that only the U.S. and EU can really work on together, like looking to see if there are ways of bridging our divergences in our regulatory or our standards mm -hmm. regimes without lowering the level of environmental health or safety protection. And we're now at that point in the negotiation uh, where the rubber meets the road and where uh, we're able to lay out a, a good framework for moving forward. I think today we made some good tangible mm -hmm. progress on, uh, on a whole array of areas, including uh, services where we have an agreement to table a new, uh, a new offer uh, uh, down the road in a couple mm -hmm couple more rounds. Uh, we also, I think, will be issuing a statement um, uh, soon on public services to clarify uh, what the relationship is between TTIP and, and public services, and that mm -hmm. we're not looking to privatize, and we're not looking to constrain government's ability to operate public services. So I think today has been very productive, mm -hmm. and we're looking forward to continuing that. Now, one of the key issues in this negotiation is how we have comparable regulations, uh, which have been the non-tariff trade barriers that now that tariffs are lower and lower, have been the real inhibitors of, of trade. This has led to concern and criticism that, despite what you said, Mike, about this not being a race to the bottom, that people say, well, it's going to be controlled by corporations and we don't trust government and somehow the, the, the standards are going to get lowered. And the reality is our surveys show that in Europe, this is a, especially in places like Germany and Austria, this is a huge problem. People do believe that their standards are better and that American standards will bring them down. Um, by the same token, our surveys show that 57% of Americans don't trust GMOs. So it's not as if the American public on some of these key issues between Europe are, are necessarily with the US government. So I guess the, my question is, how do we address this issue of bringing standards together with when we also seem to be adverse to saying, well, actually, we're going to raise standards. You know, this is going to be a race to the top, not a race to the bottom. And how do we, this, I don't hear that from either, one, others, either side that there's going to be a race to the top. So how do we, how do we, how do we um, convince a skeptical public that their kids will be safer when this deal is done? Well, this is what is so unique with TTIP, that we are, as Mike said, talking about the, the traditional trade issues, they are important. Yes. But this regulatory is becoming more and more important also globally. And there are so many issues on, on the table when we come to different technical standards and so on, where actually we have compatible standards. They are safe for our consumers, according to all objectivity and, and, and research, but they are slightly different. So if we can agree, with some of our current standards, of course not all, but identify some areas in some key sectors where we recognize each other's standards. So we don't have to duplicate, we don't have to do tests twice, we don't have to go through the process twice because they are equally white. And if we also set in motion a process where we in common, in, in, in future standards on in new technology, it could be electric cars or nanotechnology or, or who knows, where we sit together with our regulators who are really good and experienced, identifying the talent is working together, of course, giving the decision to the, 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 the elected representatives, but giving advice on future standards. They can then be globally leading, and that, that's a really important task. And they will then be high top of the top. Uh, that's at least the ambition. So we talk about existing standards, and we are seeing how far we can get. We have a lot, made a lot of progress, but also a process for future standards. And there, absolutely, the goal is to have the highest standards possible. And this is particularly important for small, medium-sized mm. businesses because a large company can run two or three different production lines. It can mm. try and meet EU standards here and US standards over here. But uh, for a small, medium-sized businesses, these differences in testing procedures and certification procedures, the fact that they can't test in one country and then ship to the, to, to the other, but they have to test in both, these add real costs mm. and make it more difficult for them to engage in, in international commerce. And we know that small, medium-sized businesses are the drivers of job creation in, in both our economies. Absolutely. And that's why there's a particular focus on figuring out how to address some of those frictions without compromising the, the level of protection that our publics have come to expect. One of the issues that links into this question of regulation and um, health and safety and so forth, is the, the question of these investor state dispute settlement panels. For those of you who 
don't follow these things closely and there's no reason why you should, <laughs> almost all investment agreements in the world have a dispute resolution mechanism in them called investor state dispute settlement panels. There are something like 1,300 of them. Um, Only in Europe. There's more, 3, more than 3,000. More than 3,000 yeah. worldwide. Yeah. Uh, by the way, the Europeans are the greatest users of these, not the Americans, but anyway, that's... And the inventors. And the, 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 Germans, inven and the Germans invented it. Yeah. it. Now, the reality is, these are in there, frankly... She said it, not me. Yes, huh? right, exactly. The inventors, th th these are in there... Yes. In, in the words of a former deputy USDR years ago, because I don't trust the Mexican courts. <laughs> and I had, a, I had a Swedish CEO say to me in a public panel in Sweden last year, I'm not going to trust the future of my company to an Alabama court. Uh, these are because even though we say we have our own domestic court systems, um, court systems tend to vary from country to country. So we have these um, dispute settlement mechanisms in there. They have become an issue of huge uh, controversy, especially in Europe. They are seen as a mechanism by which corporations can undermine domestic regulation, domestic regulatory sovereignty. Uh, Cecilia Malmstrom, you have issued some thoughts about how to fix these panels to address some of these problems. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about that, and Mike, maybe you can talk about why we think they are important for us, but maybe some Yes, those mechanisms, or ISDS, has become one of the most contested acronyms in Brussels. If you Google it, you will see that you find you f fall to the website of International Shepherd Dog Society. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about here. Um, <laughs> and it actually has become very controversial, despite the fact that they have existed since the 50s, and we all have them. And I think there is a general agreement that companies who invest maybe millions, sometimes even more, in, in a country, needs to have some sort of protection. Of course, most of that protection goes via the normal legal system. But international agreements do not become national law automatically. So there can be cases where, where there are issues, mainly they can sound technical, uh, but they are related to investment. It can be confiscation, nationalization, expropriation, or changing of licenses that will affect that company very, very negatively. And of course, the normal way should be the national courts. But if that is not possible, these have been set up. So that's quite, you know, that, 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 that's not contested per se. But they have developed uh, during the, the decades, and uh, there has been interpretation. It, it's that, that, that it leaves open for, for possible um, misuse or, or abuse by, by, by companies. So we started long ago, and so did the US, but I'll let Mike uh, talk about that. We started in the Canadian agreement, or my predecessor, to reform these processes, to make them much more limited in scope, much more transparent, open, and to see that these are really there for these issues, uh, and they will not interfere in the state's right to regulate, to protect their citizens. Um, that was a very important step forward. We are now looking, can we build upon that and be, do even more? Because this is a very strong demand from most member states and, and, and the European Parliament as well. So we are looking at, can we do more when it comes to even more clarifying the, the scope? See if the, the people who are in these arbitrators, if they can, you know, we can choose them for a pool of, of uh, qualified judges that is pre-known mm -hmm. in order to increase the legitimacy. Um, can we work towards an appeal mechanism because that doesn't exist? Uh, can we maybe see if we can also work towards long-term goals, setting up uh, um, a permanent global system of this? These are some ideas that we are, are discussing with member states and European Parliament, but we haven't come with the proposal I yet. I was going to say, can you... How assured are you think this will work? Because it does seem to me it's almost become this sacrificial lamb that mm. people say, we want to get rid of ISDS full stop. Fiddling with it is not going to be sufficient. I mean, do you have any feel for yet of how resonant your argument well, but is? Well, there are some people who, who, wouldn't, who don't like ISDS, but they don't like TTIP either. So, yeah. so these people, obviously, we cannot convince. But if you look at the mandate that I have been given unanimously by 28 member countries, it's in there. There yeah. should be ISDS clauses. Uh, so uh, we, we have to find a way if we can reform this. We are discussing with others. We will, of course, see what, 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 what we can do in, in our different uh, trade agreements. But there, is, there seems to be a need to reform them. Mike, the U.S. business community is pretty firm. They want ISDS in there. I mean, are they and the European business uh, community is very firm do, on this. Or do you well. think huh? we're willing to at least see some reform of this process? Well, we, we come to this really with two principles of mind. First and foremost, neither the U.S., and I'm sure the same is true of the 
you want to do anything that compromises the ability of our governments to regulate in the public interest, including health, safety, and, and the environment. And historically, we've come to this because uh, our view has been that as Americans do business abroad, we'd like to ensure that they have the same kind of protections that we provide both Americans and foreigners in the U.S. under our Constitution, including the, the Fifth Amendment, the Takings Clause, and everything that flows uh, therefrom. And so uh, we, as Cecilia said, for years now, and we went through a public process for three years of public consultations, hearings, uh, public comments, consultations with Congress, we have been working to uh, upgrade and reform ISDS. A lot of the concerns that people raise about ISDS, we share some of those concerns in various instances. But we can raise the standard, make it absolutely clear that governments can regulate in the public interest. We can add safeguards, including some of the ones that Cecilia mentioned about transparency, making sure that labor unions and civil society organizations can participate in these cases, can file uh, briefs, so there's total transparency into the cases uh, themselves, making sure that the standards are defined narrowly, uh, making sure that if people bring harassment cases, they can be dismissed, that attorney's fees can be awarded, allowing the governments to come together and give direction to the arbitral tribunal of how to come out. We can close loopholes that we have seen used or abused under other countries' ISDS uh, provisions. And I think together we can work to make sure that, it's like, just like in every other part of TTIP, that this is a high standard agreement that puts out the, the best possible outcomes consistent with our values. Let me ask you a question, Mike. The, what I hear when I talk to Europeans and, frankly, people in Tokyo and other places is uh, when is the administration and when are the Congress going to come together on the issue of fast track or what's tra called trade promotion authority for those of you who aren't trade wonks in the U.S. system. Uh, under the Constitution, Congress gets the right to amend any piece of legislation in front of it. That probably wouldn't work very well with trade agreements because our trading partners would not find that conducive. So since about 1972 or so, we have basically had a situation where Congress forgoes its right to amend trade legislation. We'll just have a simple up or down vote. Uh, but it's not permanent. It has to be renewed periodically. And right now, the administration does not have the right of fast track. It has to ask for it. We've been told that it's going to be introduced and we're going to have a debate and a vote on it for several months now. Can you give us a sense of what the status is of fast track? When might we begin to see consultation and, well, consultation, but, a, but hearings in the Congress and a vote? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, trade promotion authority by some measure or another actually goes back to 1934 when the New Deal Congress delegated to FDR the power to go negotiate tariff reduction agreements without even bringing them back to Congress. Since 1974, every Democratic and Republican president has worked with every Congress to, to have this authority by which Congress tells the executive what its negotiating objectives are. Congress tells the executive how to work with Congress before and during the negotiation, consultations and transparency. And then Congress, as part of this compact, uh, agrees to vote yes or no on the agreement that's ultimately brought back uh, within a defined period of time. One great misnomer of Fast Track is that it's not fast. Uh, it, we have a requirement under previous grants to give 90 days notice before we sign an agreement. Then there's a period of analysis and then Congress has up to 90 legislative days, which in our system is like dog years, um, <laughs> to, to actually act. So there is plenty of time for it to be out there in the public to be scrutinized and analyzed. Um, we have been working and with uh, uh, Chairman Hatch and Senator Wyden of the Senate Finance Committees have been working to develop uh, legislation that can have bipartisan uh, support and has been working with colleagues in the House as well. And we're uh, encouraging that process and we hope it moves forward as, as quickly as possible. But it is true, we can't move on Trans-Pacific Partnership or TTIP until you get fast track, correct? Well, we're in parallel to the work on, on Trade Promotion Authority. Uh, we are continuing to negotiate uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We're very much in the end game of that. We're closing out issues and we're narrowing the remaining differences. And throughout this process, we work hand in glove with Congress. You know, there's no area of policy where there's more collaboration between the Congress and the executive than trade policy. Uh, with TPP, we've had more than 1,700 briefings. 
with Congress, just on TPP, TTIP, several hundred. And every proposal we put on the table before we share it with the EU, it goes to our committees of jurisdiction in the House and the Senate, and we get their feedback, we get their input. Every member of Congress can see the text of the agreement. Uh, we go and we sit down with them and walk through it with our, with our negotiators to answer questions. So we work hand in glove throughout this process to make sure that what we negotiate, there's no surprises mm -hmm. at the back end and that we have their input throughout. I might share with the audience, I was at a luncheon on Wednesday with the head of the AFL-CIO, which is the umbrella union organization in the United States, and he said in public that he, he, didn't, he didn't endorse TTIP, but he basically said he thought that was something they could work with. And now he had some things he wanted in it, which you probably can't get, but anyway, there, there, there were, it was interesting that he was not opposed to TTIP the way he was to TPP. So it does seem to me there are, there's a potential here for something to be done uh, uh, that may be less controversial around TTIP than around uh, TPP. Uh, I can't let you go without, and go to the audience until we ask a question about the strategic implications of TTIP. We've had two sessions really about Ukraine and Russia. Clearly folks in Moscow are watching your negotiation. Frankly, if I were in Moscow and if Brussels and Washington can't get their act together on a simple free trade agreement, I would draw some conclusions from that. But I'm curious to get your sense of the strategic dimension of this um, negotiation, and why doesn't that animate us to get it done? Well, you answered the question why yes. it's strategically <laughs> important. I don't think Putin likes TTIP. Um, well, it is strategically important. First of all, it's, of course, important for the content and the economic benefits and also the but, regulatory. But, but why but doesn't that get us... It doesn't light a fire under both of you and your respective teams to get this done sooner. Well... We are working as, as fast as we can, but it's complicated. As I think the, the foreign minister said, if we were easy, we would have done it years ago. It is complicated, and we need to get it right. You need to get your Congress behind you. I need to get quite a lot of other <laughs> stakeholders uh, behind us. But it is important strategically, because as the world is developing, the relative um, voice of Europe and the US is, of course, shrinking. So, and we have our differences. Uh, but Europe and US share so much together, so many values, our, our strong belief in democracy, human rights, rule of law, good governance, high standards to protect our people. And if we can come together and, and show those values in concrete action via TTIP, because we also have a lot of ambition when it comes to, to rule setting uh, and so on, sustainable development and these issues, I think we, we can strengthen our position in, in the world because some of these values or many of them are not taken for granted among other partners. So it is a, a very much strategic... Can interest. I ask you a follow-up on this, though? I mean, our polling shows, and the president in his State of the Union address this year said, we want to set the rules for the 21st century of commerce and not have the Chinese set them. Our polling suggests that, I'm sure this was in there because they had their own polling that shows this resonates with the American people. We're concerned about China. We want, it, we want our guys to set the rules, not somebody else. It's not at all clear that's a very resonant argument with Europeans. Why think, do you think that is? I think it depends. For some Europeans, this is very obvious. I spent day and night talking about this issue in different uh, events, uh, meeting a lot of different people. And in some, some areas, this is really something that people you know, take, um, t t take uh, very, very seriously. In other areas, maybe this is less important. So I think it varies. We have 28 very different countries. We can see that on debates on other issues, that, that we're yeah. not always united. Yeah. But it, it is a very important agreement. And also, if we fail, we send a very bad signal to the world that we were not able to agree. Yeah. Okay, I agree with Cecilia completely, and I think you know, it's important. These trade agreements are not directed against any country, but it, they are directed towards raising the standards, uh, translating our values into high standards, rules around the world, whether it's on the protection of workers, the protection of the environment, uh, the promotion of innovation, uh, putting disciplines around state-owned enterprises so that they compete fairly with private firms, ensuring that the digital economy works for small and medium-sized businesses. These are all important values that it's important that we come together and not only agree amongst ourselves, but one key part of TTIP is that we want to work together vis-a-vis -vis other countries and other forums to help promote these values and these standards elsewhere. 
Okay, this is a great way to start. We're going to uh, uh, go to the audience for some questions. If you could identify yourself and please ask a question, not make a speech. I'll start right here. For, oh, thank you. Cindy Miller with UPS uh, here in Europe. UPS has been in business for 100 years, and the most telling tale of those 100 years is how much international trade has lifted countries, uh, nations, local economies up from poverty. And the story goes on and on and on, and it's been repeated for the last 100 years. Now we're situated, and, and I appreciated the discussion earlier about the fresh, I think you said the fresh start. Uh, in this fresh start, uh, you talked about SMEs, and we've seen the small um, family-owned businesses grow to global companies, maybe not mammoth, but, but at least doing trade outside of their borders as a result of international trade. Uh, two questions. What do you think needs to be done differently in this fresh start to really rouse the small and medium business owners here in Europe? Because our own internal polls <coughs> of of um, a couple hundred of them, there still is not necessarily the understanding of TTIP, so that's number one. What must me do, what, what should be done differently? Uh, and then secondly, with that done, um, how do we tell that tale of, of that lifting, that tide of international trade lifting, you know, raising everybody's boat? How, how does that tale get told differently? So just uh, those points. Great Thank question. You. Well, uh, we, I agree completely. I mean, in the U.S., from the U.S. perspective, of the 300,000 firms that export from the U.S., 98% are small and medium-sized businesses, and yet only a fraction of small and medium-sized businesses export, and those that do tend to export to only one country. So we see this as a huge area of potential to help small and medium-sized businesses engage in the global economy. And the kinds of issues that we've heard from them and that we're working on in our various trade agreements uh, include uh, trade facilitation and customs uh, harmonization, making things easier at the border. There's the difficulties of navigating so many different rules and procedures is a big deterrent to engage in international trade. Uh, E-commerce, you know, when, when I sit down with the, the sellers of of, on Etsy. Etsy is a platform in the U.S. where largely women sell uh, uh, goods all over the world. When they sell goods all over the world, they're using computer services, uh, telecommunication services, software services, electronic payment services, and express delivery services. And those are all the kinds of services that we want to make sure we're promoting through our trade agreements, keeping those markets open so that our providers can, can help those small businesses uh, engage in those, in those efforts. And so we, we try and look in a concerted way across the trade agreements. And you know, everywhere I go in the United States, whether it's uh, uh, Jet Incorporated in, in Cleveland or Atlas Devices in Boston or Concord Supply in San Antonio, these are all small and medium-sized businesses, all of whom have said TTIP is important to them because they see either regulations or standards or other barriers that, that they'd like to see us to address in the negotiations. But Cecilia, how do you make this sexy when the opponents are saying, no, this is really about chlorinated chickens and you know, forcing our kids to eat GMOs and we don't want, I mean, the, the opponents have a very visceral argument to make. This is terribly important. We can accept what Mike said is it's terribly important economically, and eyes glaze over when you talk about it. So, I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you make this a political argument? I'm deeply offended, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprised. <laughs> this is obviously we have a handicap for there, because yes. what, what we are talking about here, well, you made the point and you made some examples, and we can all make lots of examples of everyday small and medium-sized companies struggling yeah. uh, and, and wanting to have more, more access uh, and what, what it would mean with tariffs, because they're still important for small companies, but especially regulatory. And that is difficult to, to, to be as sexy as chlorinated yes. chicken or whatever you want. But that's why it's so important to work with these companies and to make sure that, that they, their story is told as well, because people can relate to that yeah. local family company in my community, in yes. my city. And we are trying to gather from our part live examples, existing companies who tell their story. Why yeah. would TTIP be good for them? What were their expectations? What would that mean when it comes to more investments and more jobs? And gathering them on our website for everybody to, to read let, and hoping them to engage with the, the public. Here, we, mm. we have a member of the European Parliament no. here. And, and what are you hearing from your folks? I mean, are this, the small and medium size uh, uh, businesses in your district uh, standing up for TTIP, or what I hear from my German friends is that 
In fact, even in BDI, there's debate among the big companies and the little companies about these kind of things. So I'm curious, identify yourself first. I'm, you yes, yes, I'm Alex Lambsdorff, member of the European Parliament, member of the Trade Committee. And um, your question is just right. Um, in BDI, the Federation of German Industry, by and large, people are very much in favor. Our association of small and medium-sized enterprises in Germany, because of ISDS, right now is still opposed to TTIP, as strange as it may seem. My question, however, is, and I want to ask a question, not make a speech. Um, we are always discussing this at the aggregate level. 300,000 SMEs who export, uh, expected benefits, etc. The arguments that I hear, and I'm in TTIP events nearly every day, are not aggregate. They are individual. The chicken on my plate, chlorinated, it's poisonous. Lipstick and mascara from the United States, poisonous. I never wear it as a result. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to turn to you for that particular example. Um, but it is, we need to make the case at the individual level. Where, and that's my question to the two of you, where can we give examples of individual specific benefit for the user. I mean, one example I use coming from Germany is that Americans would be much better off if they could have access to German bread. As those of you who know American bread know. Um, <laughs> and that's an it's example the best that resonates. That, that's an example that resonates at, 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 at some level, but we need to make that argument on the, on the other side as well. What does the individual citizen can expect? not on the aggregate level, but on an individual level, if TTIP comes. Of course, we can make the points that chlorinated chickens are not going to come, and, and, and GMO, and, and, and bovine growth hormone, blah, blah. All these things are not going to come to Europe. But these are defensive arguments. And I want to be able to be on the offensive, to tell these SMEs, to tell my citizens, my voters, yes, there is going to be a specific benefit for you in this. I can tell you, an American union guy said to me recently, he was amazed that the proponents didn't have the anecdotes the opponents did. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. Anecdotes, please. <laughs> he also said, look, they don't even have to be true. <laughs> oh, oh. Bruce, this, this is an important point. Yes. Yeah. If you look at these posters over there, unverhandelbar, these are made by Attac, and they are on the record as having said that it doesn't really matter to them that much whether our, their arguments are true or not as long as they are effective. And I don't want to work with things that are not true, but right. I need things that are effective yeah. and true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I made the, the case about small and uh, medium-sized companies, that we are gathering concrete examples from villages and, and cities all over Europe that people will know about. You can all read about them. We have hundreds of them on our website. And they will relate to, to, to people. We know that if that company could export a little bit more, it could be German bread or, or uh, Spanish artichokes or whatever, uh, or... or um, well, uh, mussels from mussels and oysters from from Brussels. Um, that that could actually mean more jobs for our, our community. It will also mean more more um, diverse things in the shop, cheaper clothes, uh, more choices when it comes to technology and issues. That where there are tariffs today, we have to identify this. We are working on this, but it's well, difficult because let me, let the, me, our trade nerds tend to want to to stick to facts and not lies. Let me know? let me go to the audience again, if I could. Uh, let's get a perspective from uh, Japan here. And you introduce yourself. Yeah. My name is Yoriko Kawaguchi from Japan. Okay. Okay. I am not really, um, my question concerns something else, if it's okay. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, I would like to compare the two treaties, TTIP and TPP. And for the enhanced prosperity of the, uh, the international community, I think it is very important that these two agreements are similar in standards in coverage and other things. Now, the American US is negotiating both. So to what extent in your mind this similarity is on your mind when you are negotiating and to what extent that is realized or being realized? And the same similar question to, to yeah. you, to Mike, what extent Mike, you have that on your I'm mind? Well, I think uh, while the relationship with the EU is uh, different than our relationship with uh, Malaysia or Vietnam, we certainly go into this negotiation 
trying to achieve high standards and as consistent as possible across the board. And there'll be some issues where we don't really have to talk because we have total agreement uh, on something. And there are other issues where I think working together, we can try and define these high standards. You know, and and we've, we both have many FTAs in our background and our countries have negotiated many FTAs. And so we can look at each other's FTAs and see where we've taken similar approaches uh, and different approaches to issues and try and bridge those differences. So I think you're, you are right that ultimately, our goal is to have a fairly consistent approach, consistent with our own discussion, so that together we are helping to contribute also to the, the multilateral system as they take up additional issues as well. Both of these are intended to be open platforms, ultimately, where other countries, for example, in TPP, right. there are 12 countries right now representing about 40% of the global economy. But there are several more countries who've indicated that they'd like to join when the 12 of us are finished. And again, we, the goal is to set the standards high and then to help encourage other countries to lift their, to lift their game accordingly. Let's go here. For, we only have time for a couple more questions. I'm Dan Rundy. I'm at CSIS. I want to ask both of you about an agreement that uh, you mentioned, uh, Ambassador Froman, about trade facilitation. Could you both talk about the Bali trade facilitation agreement and what each of your, uh, got, both in the, in the case of the United States and in the case of the European Union, how you're implementing the trade facilitation agreement, which has actually been signed? For the audience, this is a, an agreement uh, that struck at the WTO to try to improve uh, customs procedures and things of that nature. Um, Frankly, it's something that probably should have been done decades ago, mm -hmm. and it took forever to, to agree. So maybe you could talk to us a little bit, of, briefly, very briefly, about what's happening about that. Well, uh, that's very important, and the breakthrough just before Christmas uh, in WTO is, is positive. Uh, on the Trade for Facilitation Agreement, we are doing our utmost to encourage everybody to, to ratify it. We have started the processes internally in the European yeah. Union. We sent it to the, to the Parliament uh, and, and so on. So we are working uh, with it. Uh, it will take some time, probably by the summer or beginning of autumn, to, uh, to have it fully ratified. And we are trying to assist, if we can, other members as well. And hopefully this will contribute to... to there is a positive dynamism in the WTO now, so hopefully we can also achieve, uh, conclude the Doha round. It would be great. We've deposited our instrument of ratification in January, and we are working with other countries, uh, particularly developing countries, to encourage them mm -hmm. to move forward in their own approval processes uh, with the goal of reaching, I think it's the two-thirds of, of, of two the thirds, yes. WTO members that need to uh, ratify in order to come into being, ideally by the end of the year. And we're working to provide capacity building and other uh, forms of assistance to help countries get there. One final question here, right here. Hello, Teresa Fallon, European Institute of Asian Studies. If I may follow up on the earlier question, many people here in Europe wonder why TPP went further and faster than TTIP. So I'm wondering about the strategy, why you chose TPP, because it's very different economies, very different <laughs> cultures, whereas EU-US relations are a little more similar economies. What was the strategy of doing TPP first and seeing how things have turned out? Would it perhaps have been better to do TTIP first and then <laughs> use that to move through TPP? Thank you. And if I could ask a follow-up to Cecilia, I've talked to members of the European Parliament. They tell me they get hundreds, if not thousands, of emails about TTIP. They have yet to get a single email about your free trade negotiation with Japan. So I'd be curious to get, why is it the European population doesn't seem to care that you're doing a free trade agreement with Japan? It's a great agreement. We are halfway through, and we are working very close with our Japanese partners. I'm not saying it's a bad so, agreement. I'm telling you, uh, nobody's paying attention. We'll have to engage with any <laughs> European parliamentarian to explain the, the details of this yeah. at any time. No, no. But it's the public that's not paying attention. That's what I'm saying. Think, anyway. It will come. Huh? <laughs> I think you know, we, TPP is much longer in development than... Than, than TTIP is. We've only been negotiating TTIP really for about a year and a half, where in TPP it's upwards, it's almost five years that this has been underway, and that's why it's so much further along and so much uh, closer to uh, so much closer to completion. Um, and it wasn't a concerted effort to pick one or the other, but we engaged very much. We, we, we are an Asia Pacific power. Um, we have a strategy towards rebalancing towards Asia, and TPP is a critical component of our rebalancing strategy uh, towards Asia. And we've worked very well and very hard with these 11 other countries. Uh, it started with four other countries, and now it's uh, seven other countries, uh, excuse me, 11 other countries, to, to really break new ground in a whole series of areas. And it's been quite a positive experience. So we're looking forward to completing that and then completing TTIP as, as soon as we possibly can. 
And for all, those of you who don't know, uh, Prime Minister Abe is supposedly coming to the United States. I say supposedly, it's the biggest hidden secret in uh, modern history, I guess. Um, and we'll see if that's an action-forcing event to get a deal between the U.S. and Japan, which was a, a, a foretaste of a, of a TPP uh, deal. Thank you very much. I want to thank our, our panelists. So I think we had a great active discussion. I wish we could spend more time on this. But we're now on to the palace. Thank you. I'm just going to add my thanks and also tell you this is the moment to leave the hotel. So we're now going to Egmont Palace where we will be hosted by King Philip of the Belgians. So please just go to the front of the hotel and